right, say what? Talking donkeys. <laughs> I'd like to once again thank Joe for suggesting this series. It's been really interesting to go through some of these unusual uh, stories and try to get the information out of them, the meaning, and everything like that. Because these stories can be a little bit puzzling, a little bit peculiar. And it's um, and today we're going to be talking about Balaam and Balaam's donkey. And you know, most people have kind of a general idea of this story. Um, you know. Um, Often they'll say, well, if God can use a donkey to talk, then he can use me. That's kind of a general interpretation. A lot of people enjoy the humor of the story, which is all very um, accurate. Um, as you'll see in this, it says with Balaam's donkey, you need to take the next left. You're too close to the wine, Balaam. Be careful. Slow down at the speed limit and watch out for that squirrel. It's a cute little, <laughs> cute little cartoon. But just like every story, there is an, like an top of an iceberg uh, understanding, which I think is totally valid. But you can probably go deeper a lot of times, too, because the Bible often will present things, even in narrative, that have a greater meaning. So let's go through this material, um, starting in Numbers 22. Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan to Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. I mean, they had come through and they just had these amazing military victories. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. So in their mind, you know, you have this swarm of people and, you know, it's, it's just kind of terrifying and there was prejudice involved and just so many factors going on. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, this horde will now look up all that is around us as the ox looks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of Amwah, to call him, saying, behold, the people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and now they are dwelling opposite me. I mean, there goes the neighborhood, right? These people have come in. They're moving next to them, next to me. I don't like them. They seem really powerful. So we got to do something about this. Come now, curse this people for me, because they are since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he who you cursed is cursed. So he gives Balaam this sort of you know, tremendous amount of respect and uh, spiritual insight and direct connection with the supernatural. He's trying to put the thumb on the scale, you know. I'm going to uh, use divine intervention because I can't do it militarily. Now, Balaam is kind of a mysterious character. We don't know an awful lot about him. And so there is a lot of speculation as to exactly where he was at in terms of his relationship with God, how much of it was kind of a phony sort of thing, how much of it was real. So there's a lot of different interpretations about him. He does seem to acknowledge the God of the Bible as a sovereign God. He doesn't necessarily seem to be monotheistic, although it's hard to tell because he does get in with idolatry, but maybe he was doing it for social reasons and not because he believed it. We don't really know. And he is able to perform signs and miracles, at least according to human understanding. And he was not part of the Hebrew people, and nor did he embrace Bible-minded culture, and he seems materialistic and self-important. These are kind of the things that I think we can be pretty confident about. Um, we can go back to Jethro, who was a Midian, who was a non-Israelite who believed in God, to maybe see how he could have come to this understanding of something like ethical monotheism of some sort. There definitely was an awareness of an almighty God, even if people maybe didn't go the whole way with it and reject other gods. You know, they at least believed in there was at least one that was above the other ones. The name Balaam signifies destroyer or glutton, and it really bears a strong resemblance to Genesis 36 when it says, which is Bala, son of Beor. And of course, that signs to Edom, and then you have Edom connecting you to Esau. And again, Esau is somebody aware of God, but not really a commandment keeping, not an obedient sort of person. So let's go back to the story. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, lodge here tonight and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Okay, so fees for divination already is a little bit of a red flag as to who this Balaam character is, right? Because there are different translations of what Leviticus says in terms of divination, but more than likely he was engaging in things that are not scriptural ways of reaching the supernatural. You can certainly get that perception. 
But what's also interesting is he says, stay here and I will bring word back to you as to what God wants me to do. Now, you would think that just the default response would be, well, I'm not going to do this because who are these people? Why should I use my divine insight to try to blast these people? But instead, what he's immediately doing is saying, well, maybe God is going to say yes or I don't know. And we can take a pretty positive view of this if we want to on this one and say, okay, he's trying to consult God in this specific instance, but it's going to escalate in just a moment. So God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, behold, the people has come out of Egypt and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. And to Balaam's credit, he doesn't really sugarcoat what's going on here. He does pretty much tell God a straightforward explanation. So it could be that he's not sure, he is legitimately not sure in this situation. I can give him the benefit of the doubt right now. <laughs> We're going to keep going though. God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. So the fact he has to tell him that makes me think Balaam didn't know that. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go to your own land for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. Now that's interesting, right? That he puts it that way. It's, he kind of puts it on God. He's not like, well, I'm a good person and these people are blessed. So I'm not going to do it on my own volition. No, it's like, nope, God told me not to do it. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again, Balak sent princes more in number and more honorable than these. And they came to Balaam and said to him, thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor. And whatever you say to me, I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, could not, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you're like, congratulations, Balaam, you're doing a great job. But then he keeps going. So you too, please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Well, that doesn't seem very resolved, right? He makes this big speech about how, well, no matter what you do, I'm not going to do it. It's like, but maybe God's going to say yes. So it's, you know, you get the idea that he's somebody that is very ambiguous about like the obedience or even like principles, because like, why would he need God to explain to him yet again what he wants him to do? He was pretty clear the first time. It's like, please, please, please. And honestly, the thing is, is that Balaam may have uh, had these sort of you know, anti-Semitic or prejudiced or racial notions against these people too. He could have been playing into that as well. And God came to Balaam and said to him, if the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled him because he went. I cut it off there because that's a red flag for people because there's a whole bunch of things going on all of a sudden, right? You have essentially, it seems like God changed his mind. And then you have, he did what God asked him, but then God is mad. So it's like, what is going on here? And of course, scholars have tried to figure out exactly what is happening in here, because it seems like you have to read between the lines, because at face value, it doesn't quite make logical sense. It's like God is doing a complete U-turn. And of course, we know on a moral decision, God's not going to do that. So one way that people have interpreted this is when he says, if the men have come to call you, rise, go with them. It's almost like he's kind of being a little ambiguous as sort of a test. And he's, he's, he, there's all these stipulations on it. And so it's like he's not really changing his mind morally about what to do, but he's, he's kind of giving Balaam enough rope to hang himself. Some people interpret it that way. That's not really my favorite interpretation, but I can see where they get there. Um, this kind of shades of gray where I kind of go is more the rabbinic or tradition and it's where it says he saddled his donkey and I'll explain why. So let's say Bill Gates was in his house and he say, these people came to him and they said, we want you to write this horrific article about somebody. We're going to put it everywhere. And he's like, well, I don't know if I should do that. I'm going to ask God. And God says, no, don't do that. Leave your house and uh, don't write the article. And then he's like, okay. And then he spends the next night and he says, he asks God and God says, okay, you know what? You can stay in your house, but don't write the article. And the next day, Bill Gates was in his house vacuuming his uh, office. 
Now, now, that would seem like a really weird detail to add, and that's what people jump on. Saddling his donkey is kind of a weird detail because Balaam is somebody of great importance. Why is he saddling his own donkey? Why isn't it a servant? And so what some people interpret that as is that's showing you that Balaam is not going to actually follow God's instructions. He's rising up early. He's kind of going about this himself. He's very passionate about it, and he has already resolved not to obey God. And you can infer that from the saddling his donkey. Either way, you have to do some inference because the text is not, in my opinion, 100% clear. So you have two different options there. Now, when you see more rising in the morning and saddling your donkey, you get to Abraham. Now, why would that be a parallel? Well, we'll get to that in a moment, but keep that in the back of your mind. But God's anger was kindled because he went... And the angel of the Lord took a stand in, in his way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the field. Jenny, you know, she's a female donkey. <laughs> we'll just call her Jenny. Now the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. This verse has a lot of significance if you just kind of break it down, okay? Let's see what's kind of going on here. Well, first of all, we have a narrow path. Now, we all know when the Bible's talking about path, it's talking about obedience, like when Christ says, you know, enter by the narrow gate. So, okay, we have that going on. We have vineyards. Well, what's going on with vineyards? Well, wine is a source of blessing, but you also have the sacrifice of Christ with grapes. Okay, finally, you have the angel of the Lord here. Now, who's this angel of the Lord? If we, spoiler alert, eventually <laughs> Balaam is going to um, bow in front of this angel, which has a lot of implications because if we look at Revelation, it says, don't bow. He says, don't do that. Worship only God, right? Revelation 22. So this is probably not just your run-of-the-mill angel. And in fact, most scholars will say this is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. It's God coming in that form. So you have Christ standing in a narrow path with grapes on either side. It's very beautiful imagery, you know, if you just look at it poetically. Now, why couldn't a believing person see Jesus Christ? Is kind of the question, right? Because you have somebody who believes in God, but he can't see Christ right in front of him. Fascinating. Now, we all know with gravity, it's something, it's a force we cannot see, right? We, we know of its existence. We believe in its existence. I'm not going to go out onto a building and I'm going to like walk off the ledge because I know that gravity will take hold and I will crash. So can you see gravity? Yes, you can see gravity like this. If we know the rules of gravity, we can actually see gravity very well. We can make all kinds of postulations about gravities. We can create computer simulations that, that, uh, that will accurately depict gravity. So yes, you can, but you need to understand the order and the rules in order to see the effect, right? And so in my opinion, this is kind of a similar situation. Balaam is a, is a believer, but he doesn't really understand God as a God of order. He doesn't understand God as a God of rules. He's, he's living in this gray area, and he, so he can't literally see him right in front of him. We all know that Isaac Newton, who was somebody who was very much an ethical monotheistic type, is the person that come up, came up with all these theories. And it's because he believed in an orderly universe and an orderly God that we even have all these theories of gravity in the first place. As it says in John, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He was here right in front of us, but he didn't behave in a way that people expected. And so they rejected him, like you just heard. You know, they didn't understand that God would come and, and interact with us on that level. Jews can't accept the idea that God would take human form. They don't understand the rules of which God exists. But we can because we have the Bible. So in a sense, we can see Christ. So let's keep going. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood at a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff. Now, in general, the Bible is not good for animal abuse either. Like this is also showing something about Balaam's character, you know, abusing something much weaker than yourself. 
Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, No. <laughs> Just a very short answer. It's actually the shortest sentence um, in this book. <laughs> now, Jenny, let's not forget that don't be fooled by the way she talks. She's still Jenny from the stocks, okay? <laughs> but why is Jenny a female donkey? It's just kind of an interesting question, right? Because you could have been a male donkey. Usually when you hear animals, you assume male. So what, what, let's speculate a little bit. We're going to get into a little bit of spin here. When we look at what the Bible says about the church, the church is, is framed as female, presenting herself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or other blemish, holy and blameless. This is our goal. And look, this is what the donkey says. You know, I, haven't I been faithful to you? Haven't I, haven't you, haven't I been nice and all these things? And the truth of the matter is, no matter how you kind of spin this verse, it's a good example in terms of preventing negative behavior, right? You want to be in this situation where you can say, what have I done to you? I'm telling you not to behave in this way, and I have your best interest at heart. What have I done to you all my life? And that's just kind of the example we want to set in general. We want to be able to show the way to Christ through our uh, walk, and we want to be able to point to our own character when we're going to reach that friction, because we will have times that people will beat us for things that we're trying to prevent us them from doing. And But we have to be able to tell them, and they have to believe us, that we have their best interests at heart. As it says here, genuine people versus hypocritical people. <clears throat> Now, some people might wonder why it is I pick specific translations when I do uh, the my Bible readings. Well, let's try to look and see what this looks like in the Old King James, because this is a very fun rendering. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do unto thee? And he said, Nay. <laughs> now, it's an unintentional pun, right? He's saying nay to a donkey, but it reads very funny. <laughs> As one person said, the donkey is a perfect picture of a simple, unspectacular, yet obedient follower of God, sensitive to God's direction, a thorn to the disobedient, and a victim of the wrath of the disobedient. Good point. <clears throat> so let's keep going. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. See, now you can see this is about obedience. For I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. So now he's finally seeing that God has the ability to grant morality He's telling him, if what you say is evil, I'm going to not do it and everything. And angel of the Lord said to Balaam, you can go with them, go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. And ultimately, he says some very profound things, such as blessed are those who bless you and cursed are those who curse you. You know, as the most strong reversal you can possibly say versus what he was going to start. And it's funny because his... Uh, Blessings is now read on a weekly basis in synagogues. So it's the complete reversal of what he wanted. If he was going to be this, you know, racist person that wanted to marginalize the Jews as being uh, somebody that God shouldn't favor, he ends up doing the opposite and then being uh, canonized by them. So it's very fascinating how that worked out. But it kind of shows you a little bit of what Christ is getting at, too, when he says, and this isn't numbers, this is in Matthew. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father is in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And according to the scriptures, Balaam apparently did have some sort of ability to do these things. But he says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Again, if you don't really understand the rules of which God exists, you don't really know him. And he says, you know, he never knew you either. Like, how do you really understand? You know, if you have this kind of antinomian or very anti-law perspective, you're not really understanding God for what it is. He becomes this ambiguous, wispy character that isn't what the Bible suggests. 
Uh, James B. John, I believe I'm pronouncing it right, junior researcher for Tyndale House in Cambridge, Eng England, says, God is a God whose word can be implicitly trusted. We, however, cannot always be trusted. Our interpretation of God's word is inevitably influenced by our own desires and agendas. We have a tendency to find what we want to find when we read scripture. And sadly, we often find we often want to find ambiguity. When passage X is inconvenient, our natural instinct is to set out in search of a more ambiguous passage, i.e. one ambiguous enough to accompany a range of views and more often than not, we find one. Whereas Abraham heard what he didn't want to hear, i.e. a command to sacrifice his beloved son and nevertheless obeyed God, Balaam heard what he wanted to hear. So there, that's where you can kind of go back to that ambiguous section and maybe see what, it's, what the, the point of that is. You know, it does seem like it's speaking to that sort of concept. Again, we want to walk in a straight line. We want to be that example. We can essentially want to be the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> and we will be doing more of these. Um, and so stay tuned next week for another unusual story from the Bible. <laughs>